Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I want to thank folks for joining, as well as uh, our guest, Dr. Sandesh Nagamani, and we'll introduce him at, at greater length in a minute. Um, but I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit as an introduction to what we're calling the Excellence in Clinical Research Seminars. And um, although there's several names on this list that I recognize and have worked with, um, several of you I haven't, but I'm Dr. Chris Hours. I'm a pediatric oncologist that works with Les Biesecker, um in segmental overgrowth disorders and investigating therapeutic trials in, in those disorders. And so this has been a, a particular topic of interest of myself and I, I think in the, the broader genetics community. Next slide. So Oleg and I were talking about, you know, ways that we can enhance clinical research education. I think these seminars are uh, one of the, the ways that we thought about doing this. So our, our goal here is to recognize that genetics is not only a diagnostic subspecialty, but also now a therapeutic one too, especially with um, many of these new technologies. And, um, you know, the, this is sort of the, the motivation for, for this talk and, and future ones to get trainees exposed and also among faculty within NHGRI's intramural program and, and to talk about these topics more. So um, the, um, you know, the examples I have on the slide here, some of you may know are recently FDA approved um, medications or gene therapies uh, that have arose from this, um, you know, application of, um, genetic knowledge. And, you know, we, we say clinical research, it's a very broad umbrella. Um, but, you know, I think these seminars, at least at first, are going to focus on interventional clinical research to sort of focus us and, and more specifically in clinical trials. Um, but we do hope that this is an interactive and, um, you know, worthwhile uh, thing for folks to participate in. So please make use of the chat box. So we'll, Oleg and I'll monitor that as we go along. Um, certainly, you can unmute yourself to engage in conversation, which is what we hope this to be. And if you have suggestions for future seminars or topics of interest, or just want to chat with one of us about clinical research, please do. Next slide. Um, so just very broadly, some of the topics that we consider to be in this umbrella of things that we're talking about, um, you know, even clinical trials itself is a pretty broad thing. So. I've listed some things here, such as study designs or even preclinical research and the, that first act of translating bench discoveries into the clinic. And then there's other you know, important aspects of not only the science, but the involvement of regulatory agencies like the FDA. Um, how do you manage all this clinical data? There's of course the issues of funding and budgets. Um, the, the fact that some of these can't be done without industry partnership and um, you know, also, you know, in this understanding that this is a human subjects research endeavor and ethics is a, plays a major role in, in what we do. Next slide. So for today, um, we plan to focus on the basic question of how a study is built from its initial research question, talk a little bit about the team required to design a study, the overall trial designs, such as randomization with placebo control, and then there's others out there other than the, the gold standard randomized controlled trial. A little bit about eligibility criteria. You know, when you build a clinical trial, what disease are you studying and what types of patients are you studying? Um, we'll talk, touch a little bit on outcomes and endpoints. Um, you know, those are our fancy ways of saying, what are we going to measure to know that our intervention is successful or not, or you know, having the intended consequence. Um, and then of course, from that is a, the hypothesis of what will change. And of course, there's many other things that we may get to today. Um, or, you know, I think each of these bullets could be a, a whole hour discussion in itself. And so we'll frame this by starting with the um, journal article that was sent out previously, but much more in a conversational manner um, of one of the, the folks that led that effort. Um, and that, that, study that we sent out. Oleg, I'll, I'll pass this to you now. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Chris, for this wonderful uh, introduction. And it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce and to welcome our colleague and uh, our long-term friend, uh, uh, Dr. Sandesh Nagamani. 
Dr. Sundesh Nagamani is an uh, is associate professor at the uh, Baylor College of Medicine in the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics. He also uh, serves as vice chair of clinical research in, uh, in the department. Um, Sandesh has a lot of experience with uh, clinical trials, and um, it is my great, great pleasure to uh, uh, I really cherish this opportunity to um, uh, learn from Sandesh and his uh, uh, experiences um, uh, that he had accumulated uh, through his involvement uh, in many clinical trials and uh, many aspects of regulatory medicine. Today, we will, we will focus uh, um, on, on unpacking uh, a uh, a lot of content that is hidden in uh, uh, in the, the paper uh, that was published in JCI in 2014 on describing clinical trials, um, uh, a clinical trial of teriparatide in adults with osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, to, uh, the reason why we uh, chose uh, this um, uh, paper uh, is the following. It is, you know, it is a seminal paper. It, it, you know, as of that day, it was the largest placebo-controlled randomized trial in adults with uh, osteogenesis imperfect. It was, to my knowledge, the first trial uh, in OI involving an anabolic agent. So it was a novel agent, although it had some interesting history uh, that was supported its potential uh, uh, benefit uh, in, in, uh, in this patient population. The, the study was sufficiently powered to detect difference uh, in, primary, in the primary outcome. But of course, uh, the question that I had, and, and that I will save this big question for Sandesh uh, uh, until a little bit later. Uh, the big question is, was it with the data that you had accumulated? Was that enough to progress from IND, the initial new drug uh, application? Uh, um, I'm sorry, for, from the IND to the to NDA, new drug um, application, uh, in order to um, uh, be uh, uh, approved by FDA uh, for uh, uh, for the indication uh, for which it was studied. I'm going to pause here, and I really wanted to uh, create an opportunity for um, Sandesh maybe to share a couple of things uh, about himself, and most importantly, uh, uh, Sandesh, I have a big question for you. How did you get interested in clinical trials in in bone diseases. So again, many thanks to uh, Chris and Oleg for this opportunity to talk to all of you. And uh, uh, what I also want to say is Oleg and I were uh, co-fellows together, so we go a long way back. Uh, one of the reasons as to why I got interested in uh, rare bone disorders is that uh, Bader was a big center for uh, osteogenesis and perfecta, and our primary mentor that Oleg and I shared had uh, sort of uh, two major interests. One was uh, the inborn errors of metabolism, urea cycle disorders, and I do a lot of clinical research in uh, UCDs as well. And the second one was uh, rare bone disorders, and so I chose based on the specialty that was. Uh, available, uh, but also what really fascinated me was uh, was I was always interested in skeletal uh, biology and skeletal medicine. So, understanding a rare bone disease as a model to understand more common disorders such as osteoporosis was really encouraging, and that's why I went to do this. Okay, thank you, Sandesh. Um... I wanted to uh, maybe set the scene a little bit uh, and to to, uh, uh, to refresh my um, uh, understanding of uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. So, if you don't mind, I would like to spend maybe this, uh, uh, a couple of minutes uh, reviewing uh, this disorder uh, with you. So, osteogenesis imperfecta is a heritable form of connective tissue disorder. It is relatively common, um, one in fifteen thousand live births, and it has variable presentation. Uh, the four hallmarks of these uh, uh, disorders uh, is fractures, dentinogenesis imperfecta, hearing loss, and blue sclera. Now, blue sclera, the variable presentation, and it's probably only pertinent not only within each type of osteogenesis imperfecta where you see variable presentation, but you can also see quite a different uh, uh, range of, uh, of um, uh, manifestations from one type of OI uh, to another. Uh, but it, it sounds like when you look at, um, you know, the variable presentation, it, what it looks to me, uh, Sandesh, is for, for you focused on one particular outcome 
uh, that we see in osteogenesis and perfecta, and that is fractures. Is there, is there a particular reason why it was, uh, or fractures or bone health, is there a particular reason why that was selected as one of the main outcomes to focus on? So uh, I think it's because of two reasons. One, in spite of OI being a uh, heritable connective tissue disorder that affects many of these and others such as muscle weakness, ligament dyslaxity, uh, cardiopulmonary outcomes, um, skeletal deformities are the number one cause of morbidity in this disorder. Recurrent fractures are a major issue. And second, in this trial, what we were doing is to look at repurposing of a medication that was used to alter bone remodeling. It was not a molecular mechanism specific therapy. So it is hmm. very unlikely that that therapy would affect either hearing loss or cardiopulmonary outcomes. So those were the reasons why we limited it to the bone. Okay. Thank you. And what I, um, one thing I realized is that when I trained, uh, and that was not that far, uh, that long ago, uh, we really had at that time uh, only three genes to uh, uh, to interrogate if we suspected a clinical diagnosis of osteogenesis imperfecta. That's col one a one, col one a two, and CRTAP TAP uh, at that time. Uh, but since then, a lot of things changed. And what I see right now is, and this is the illustration that I borrowed from one of your presentations, is that I see there's a there are quite a few um, uh, d uh, disorders that are linked to the same phenotype. And does that make a difference in terms of selecting patients for, uh, for the clinical trial in terms of the prevalence of the disease, the mechanism of the disease? Uh, what implications does it have for, and also maybe there's another aspect, is that how do you confirm that somebody has that diagnosis in order to be eligible for the trial? Right. So, uh, Oleg, as you elucidated, this was, this was uh, these were slides from 2014 or 15, so they're now there are at least uh, 18 plus genes known to cause the many forms of OI, and now they're counting 18 genotypes and, and more. But Oleg brings up an important point as to which patients do you enroll. In one way, over 90% of individuals with OI, uh, they have either type one collagen structural mutations or mutations that affect the uh, post-translational modification and processing of collagen. So 90 to 95% of all OI still occurs due to type 1 collagen-related uh, mechanisms. The others are rare. Uh, most of the trials that are ongoing are address uh, the type 1 collagen-related OI, not only from the ease of enrollment, but also from the larger population they can target. But as we understand mechanism-specific therapy, so there's an ongoing trial we're uh, conducting now, which is molecular mechanism therapy for TGFBA inhibition. We've limited enrollment only to genotype specifics for triple helical domain of type 1 collagen or the CRTAP Prolo 3 chaperone complex. Okay. So, and uh, that leads me to uh, uh, this next slide, again, that I borrowed from one of your presentation is about molecular mechanisms leading to uh, the fracture. And that really underwrites the, the, the rationale for choosing uh, a teriparatite uh, as an anabolic uh, uh, a chemical. And also maybe I will highlight this potential limitations uh, with regards to um, its ability to improve patients' outcomes. So uh, it sounds like if we really look at the mechanisms of OI, it really emerges at the interface of three um, mechanisms, not necessarily you know, sort of excluding each other. They could be mutually reinforcing. It's one of the abnormally, abnormal structure of the fibrils, altered interaction with the matrix protein in the bone and connective tissue and uh, change cell-cell and cell matrix interactions, all of them resulting in the degree, de uh, decreased bone mass, which leads uh, to fractures. And I, I really found this particular slide, again, I borrowed that from your presentation, uh, one of your past presentations, is really highlights the fact that um, the bone health and the strength and the bone mass is really uh, exists as a uh, in the balance between the bone resorption and bone formation. And there has been at the time when you initiated and started this trial, uh, um, uh, 
um, medications or drugs that could be used to decrease the bone, uh, uh, decrease bone resorption to by inhibiting the activity of osteoclasts. The bisphosphonates is a classic example of that. You know, it decreases the bone turnover, increases bone mineral density, decreases pain, and increases uh, quality of life. But they had not been any agents at that time which would focus on increasing the bone formation through stimulation of osteoblasts. And uh, they had been uh, prior experience with teriparatide as an anabolic agent to stimulate bone formation. Just to remind everyone that the teriparatide refers to the first 34 amino acids of the end terminus of parathyroid hormone. It has an interesting regulatory status. It has been approved for the treatment of osteoporosis in women uh, uh, after menopause. It has shown to increase uh, uh, lumbar spine bone mineral density, modus increase in the hip bone mineral density, and dramatic decrease in, uh, in the frequency of fr fractures. In fact, one of the studies that I showed that I found shows a 50% decrease in the fractures in postmenopausal uh, women. But then, of course, that sort of that provides the rationale for and you know, to to see if whether this can this uh, ke chemical can or you know uh, uh, peptide can increase bone mineral density in subjects with osteogenesis imperfecta by stimulating bone formation. And this is where we get to this, uh, um, you know, a critical point in uh, devising a clinical trial. And I really would appreciate your uh, insights. And Chris, I know you spent a lot of time thinking about this particular aspect. You know, the critical decisions about the regulatory pathway, study design, sample power calculations, and uh, cohort, the uh, formation of the cohort, the exclusion and in inclusion criteria, and really focus and really defining the outcomes, primary, secondary, and exploratory. Uh, Chris, you want to, uh, I'm sure you've, you've, I know you've saved quite a few questions uh, to highlight some of this, <laughs> some of the questions, some of the aspects of, uh, of clinical trials. Yeah, I, and, you know, I think you've, you've well laid out in, in these past few slides, sort of this rationale for choosing a particular agent and the target population to apply it to. Um, I guess one of my first questions was once you have that question that, and, you know, a population and an agent, what were some of the, those other sort of initial steps that took this from an idea and research question to building a, a team that could uh, approach this um, with a clinical trial? What was the, I guess, the team building aspect up front? Who was involved? What players? And, and led it to fruition. So uh, one additional thing about um, the current therapy for OI, bisphosphonates have been very well studied in children with OI. But uh, when you look at the adults who've already, some of whom have already received years of therapy, they may not have, uh, they may not respond the same way. So we were a bunch of uh, adults trained uh, OI related docs who were, who got together. So this was, uh, uh, the efforts were led by Eric Orwell uh, at OHSU and Dr. Uh, Jay Shapiro at Kennedy Krieger and had a longstanding history in adult OI and management of patients. And our center, again, had cared for a lot of patients here with adults with OI. And so the idea was to look at three large adult centers that would have enough patient population to enroll who also had expertise in OI. Uh, so th that's how we ended up coming up with this. What also helped was that uh, these centers were also involved in what is called a linked clinical research center for osteogenesis imperfecta, something that was driven by the patient advocacy group. So we did know, uh, we had participated in, in longitudinal sort of uh, cohort studies. And since all of us work with this patient advocacy groups, as most of us do in rare disorders, we uh, worked under their, you know, un under their cheerleading to make sure that we move this forward for a uh, anabolic sort of therapy in uh, adults with OI. Yeah, I, I'm actually interested if you could speak a little bit more about the patient advocacy side of that, those initial steps. And, um, you know, clearly these groups are vital for rare disease research. I'm curious, to what extent were they involved in some of the trial designs or, um, you know, the intervention itself or, or how it was being applied or measured? And, and what kind of input did you or the, you know, the team building this trial 
take from advocacy groups? Uh, so for this particular trial, I say that uh, much of the design was done by the investigators. But what really we appreciate from the uh, patient advocacy groups is, A, is there actually a need for another sort of medication? And what particular outcomes are they most likely to find meaningful? And this would be important uh, in developing endpoints and assessing the right sort of outcome measures. And also the feasibility of this, wherein, uh, you know, if they have to come in these number of times, do you think we will have enough patient engagement? And also for the enrollment, would it be possible for the uh, patient advocacy groups to sort of uh, let their members know that there's an ongoing trial, which would sort of help enrollment? Now, many of uh, some of the patient population may be wary of participating in the trials just because uh, they do not know what it entails or they may be concerned about the adverse events. And having a patient advocacy group that looks out for them to say, listen, this is a trial that is being done within the umbrella where we know what the uh, investigators are doing, I think that helps immensely in enrollment of uh, patients with eye disorders. And I just want to maybe uh, draw the attention of our trainees is that if you really carefully think about how many uh, patient advocacy groups are out there, the, uh, not every disease or group of disorders actually has um, a, a patient advocacy uh, group representing their interests. So, and I think a lot of very motivated physicians um, and uh, healthcare professionals, nurses and uh, nurse practitioners that we work with can play instrumental role in jumpstarting some of those efforts. I wanted to uh, 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 really focus on the, on the first slide uh, that I you know, borrowed from, uh, from your uh, paper, and that is the, uh, the study design. I have to say that there are very few uh, examples, I think, out there, and especially in the realm of uh, rare bone disorders, where uh, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled uh, study design um, is, is used. And I know that, um, you know, ha having been trained in the same sort of uh, educational space uh, with Sundesh, I know there's a, you know, it, it's, it is obviously a favored uh, uh, study design, although it is the hardest one to, uh, to implement. Can, can you share your experience uh, with uh, organizing randomized double-blind placebo control RCT trials um, in rare diseases? And what, you know, if you, if you were to fix one problem, what would that be? <laughs> so, I don't know. Uh, so for the fix one problem, is it uh, scientific or familial? I can give you the latter answer easier. But uh, you know, for, for this, if there are very ultra rare groups, uh, you're absolutely right that it's very hard to do uh, randomized uh, double blind placebo controlled trials. And in uh, ultra rare disorders where you may have 10, 20, 30, 40 patients at the maximum. Mm -hmm. And again, because the response may not be equivalent and you know, same magnitude across the spectrum, one of the enrichment uh, uh, designs wherein you sort of subselect a cohort of patients who are more likely to design and then randomize them, that would be much better. An okay. alternative for the trainees is that when you have a smaller group of individuals, you use what is called a crossover design, wherein each uh, patient is assigned to both a placebo and an intervention, but they first get the placebo versus first get the treatment, and they're crossed over to get the other treatment after a washout period. Why we couldn't do that here is that at least in teripatitis, in the adult population, once you give this for a span of one and a half years, there is a prolonged fracture. I mean, the bone density does remain at least you know, stable or the effects are there for years. So the washout period you would have to have is quite a long period and that would be impractical. So that's why we have to do the uh, uh, a parallel group design. Now, we had to make sure that this was uh, randomized because the outcome measures should not have been biased by what, uh, what treatment they got into. 
But there are a lot more studies now that are uh, coming along with the uh, double-blind uh, placebo-controlled trials, albeit with the smaller sample sizes. And I guess there's an, uh, another uh, aspect for some conditions where natural history is relatively well understood, you can use historic controls. That's another way to maybe um, adapt your study design to the realities of their rare diseases. Um, there have been some discussions in the past about using asymmetric as, uh, assignment to placebo versus therapy or to uh, active agent to maximize you know, the group of patients uh, assigned into uh, an active agent. What are your thoughts on it? I think that's a great idea, especially if you're comparing it to controls. In order to increase the sample size, you can have two, three controls for every uh, patient that you had, or you randomize a lot more number of patients on the intervention versus those that got the placebo. But the problem is because you're having all these, uh, on, on the bone density part, you also need to have precision, right? Mm -hmm. If you have too few in one versus the other, you may underestimate or overestimate. So that's why we wanted to make sure that at least there's equal representation on both of those mm -hmm. uh, groups. But yeah, so too uh, few patients uh, will, will result in wider uh, variability, right. your standard deviations will be wider, and that, you know, right. while you think you create a tighter uh, uh, numbers for the intervention, wider standard deviations in the placebo control group will sort of even everything out. So it only works to some degree. Go and ahead. I think you're making an excellent point that these decisions of what to measure, how to measure it, and what kind of randomized trial you're doing are all interconnected and inform one another. So a randomized controlled trial with a placebo, you know, is a decision not only based on scientific integrity, but also what you're measuring and whether that's applicable. I think it, it's important for trainees to know that the RCT is what you hear about it most commonly, but there are many different ways of skinning this cat, including delayed starts, withdraws. You can randomize not only the patients, but timing. Uh, Sandesh, you mentioned the crossover study. And I list these just to, to say that there's many different paths that people are taking, but you know, in the context of what you're measuring, in the target population and ensuring that it's applicable. Um, but there's a, it's a, a lot of variety there to, to explore. Yeah, th there's a question from Dr. Solomon, clinical director of NA at NHGRI. Hey, thanks, and thanks for coming. This is, this is great and uh, a, a terrific opportunity for everybody, including myself. Um, I want to follow up on some of the questions that Oleg was asking about recruitment, Sandesh, um, if that's okay. You know, I see all the time, and, and Chris is probably more familiar than I with this, the data that, for example, for cancer trials, you know, everybody's taking part of the, them if they're, I hate to say it's, you know, fortunate enough to live near an academic medical center, you know, if they're by the coast and so on and so forth. Um, I was curious about your experience with this trial or more genuinely in, in trials with, with OI or with other things. So to what extent are folks lucky enough to be around Baylor or Hopkins or OHSU or these other things or traveling from all over. And I know it depends, you know, it's very different, Chris, with Proteus syndrome, but I'm just curious, do you see big biases where people are from uh, and, and so on and so forth uh, with, with these conditions? And maybe just to echo uh, uh, Dr. Solomon's comment is, uh, you know, I'm looking at the dropout rate here, about 20%, this extra commute. Uh, I'm sure there are trade-offs. You're right. And again, uh, I think that if you were to look at uh, some of the ultra rare disorders that we do, um, many of them, vast, I would say probably 70% of them are from outside of Houston and they travel either by you know, air or by uh, road. For this particular trial at our site, um, I would say probably if we consider Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma as one big um, you know, catchment area and one single local area, we may have had two or three patients locally, uh, but majority of them came from uh, elsewhere, including the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that I uh, find out is uh, because of the logistics of getting some of these therapies, especially when you don't have a regular job and you may not have you, know, you may not be able to do that regular job. They, many of the patients see this as, a, uh, as an opportunity to get a treatment. Uh, and so they are quite motivated 
and they travel long distances. So many of them did. Now, uh, I think uh, Chris had asked uh, about, is it ethical that you put them onto a placebo group? Shouldn't they be on some sort of treatment? Again, there's no standard of care in adults. And if you were to look, most of these patients were not on any medicines before. But what we did was those patients who were on placebo, after the trial ended, they were given an opportunity to go on the drug for the next 18 months on a, um, on a use, uh, per use basis. And also, I put in the chat a link to a uh, alternative design for clinical trials and rare disorders that will show you some of the enrichment sort of designs which the fellows may, may um, find interesting. So that's a review article that I just sent. Oh, American Journal of Medical Genetics. It is. There you go. <laughs> Dr. Solomon. <laughs> uh, well, you know, deep within uh, the methods section, uh, Sandesh, I believe, you know, is hidden what the most critical piece of study design that I think, unfortunately, is often overlooked by, by many of us, including myself. But I think, you know, if we spend just maybe half an hour on, uh, you know, power calculations, uh, it really changes the trajectory and it allows us to, uh, you know, maximize the use of uh, clinical resources and, and patient uh, population in a meaningful way. Um, you know, some of the assumptions are pretty fundamental, and, and I don't think they change too much about the alpha, uh, you know, 80% power, uh, you know, 5% difference. You know, that's sort of a big question, right? How do you define clinical difference versus uh, biological difference? And, you know, I think that's outside the scope of the study. But then I really wanted to maybe focus on the 15% uh, uh, subject dropout rate. Because, you know, and it will, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, for, for example, for gene therapy trials where there's only one injection involved, the dropout rate is probably going to be very, very small, if, if anything, uh, as opposed to patients who have to receive daily injections plus travel to the clinical center. Um, I noticed that it, you know, in your calculations, uh, um, you know, the, the subject dropout rate was more than 15%. When you reflect back on the study design, did you feel that uh, it could have changed anything if you were a little more generous and maybe 20, 25% subject dropout rate? Or in the end, you felt, felt like it didn't really make that big of a difference? That's a great question. Like I'll, I'll take it in two sort of different ones. One, right, is like, what did we calculate the power for, right? We say a 5% difference between treatment and placebo. That's a good number, but what does that mean for the patients? And that's an important mm -hmm. one for power calculations. Now, in so let me actually preface by saying we don't know what a 5% increase in bone mineral density does to the fracture rate in individuals with OI. In the uh, patients who are from the osteoporosis world and the older one, a standard deviation decrease in, uh, in the uh, bone density, which equates to around 10%, that is associated with a 50% increase in the relative risk for fracture. And so it's, it's unlikely that you're gonna get a 10% increase on, um, on bone density. And even with the most robust agents, you get somewhere between seven and eight, excepting the newer ones. Bisphosphonates it's typically you can target for 5%. Uh, bone uh, changes. And so, and so based on the prior clinical experience and preclinical studies, 5% uh, change in the bone mineral density can actually translate into meaningful clinical results. In, in, in the non-OI population. Non -OI. In, those, in those with metabolic bone disease and osteoporosis. I see. We're trying to look as to what that would mean in the, uh, in the OI population. So we have large natural history cohorts we have looked at. And in children, not adults, if you're less than 14 years, one gram uh, per centimeter square increase in bone density reduces your relative risk of fracture by, I'm sorry, I misspoke, not relative risk. It reduces the association of fracture risk by 25%. It's the marginal effects on the regression. Mm -hmm. But here, we had to pick something that would be achievable Mm -hmm. as well as something that, at least in the adult population, has shown to reduce fracture risk. So that's why 5% was chosen. The second aspect Oleg brought about is that, yeah, you, you said 15% subject dropout rate, but it was higher. So were you powered enough to do this? 
And he's right in the sense that at the end, when we analyzed, we analyzed less than uh, the number of individuals we did. This again, when we did an interim analysis, we did see that there was a realistic probability that we would achieve that number even with fewer patients than 90. So at the end, it did not make a difference. However, these are considerations you have to put in uh, while calculating the uh, sample size. Mm -hmm. Did you not see a difference because you were not powered enough to do it or was there no actual difference is an important question. Yeah. And then, you know, there's another thing that constrains, further may constrain the pool of eligible patients. And I have one question. I'm sure that uh, Chris has another question for, for you about this. And that is, um, I noticed in the inclusion criteria, you emphasize that, you know, adults with a clinical diagnosis of OI, and I, I think that's, uh, that's understandable. But why fusion, uh, uh, why patients had to have fused epiphysis? So uh, one is that that's sort of a sign of, uh, you know, pediatric skeleton versus adult skeleton. The second aspect is because preclinical studies with teriparatide and rat models had shown a high risk for osteosarcoma. And as you would know, most of these are at the upper ends of the gro growth plates in the longer bones. So we wanted to make sure that we minimize sort of that risk. Uh, in anybody who sort of has unfused efficacy. So we, uh, from a safety perspective, as well as from making sure that they were adult skeletons without growing growth plates, we ended up uh, having fused so, so exposure to a teriparatide in individuals with uh, 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 active growth plates may increase their risk of what kind of complications? Uh, no, no, no. I don't, I'm not saying that they increase the risk of osteosarcoma, but osteosarcoma uh, in the preclinical model, uh, rat models. In rat models, yeah. Right. So when rats were uh, treated between three and 60 times the dose that is used in humans for a prolonged period of time, they develop many bone tumors. So what we have to do when treating adults with osteoporosis also is to make sure that those with high risk for osteosarcoma, Paget's disease, all those people are excluded from treatment. And mm -hmm. here, because you know, children, there's a bimodal peak for osteosarcoma, right? In the teens with uh, open epiphyses. And so that's why we wanted to make sure that we, uh, we, we from a safety perspective as well, we don't uh, include them. I see. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, and I think from a safety perspective and also this um, question about osteosarcoma in a preclinical model, one potential advantage you had when repurposing an agent versus a first in human or earlier uh, or unapproved agent was an existing safety data set um, and it experience in the osteoporosis world. Again, non-OI, so you know maybe it doesn't translate perfectly, but there's there's reason to feel that that it does. And I. I guess my question is, how does that influence your exclusion criteria when you're selecting who should not be on this agent, and, and how was that informed? So, uh, let me unpack that uh, for a second. Like, do you think you can go back one slide, if you don't mind, please? Yeah, there you go. So <clears throat> Chris actually hit it really on the, uh, on the head of the nail, where uh, it is much, uh, it is lot less onerous if you have approved therapies because within the FDA, you have a drug master file with all of the preclinical safety data as well as the human clinical data. So if you're not using doses that are uh, far beyond what would be accepted normal, from a safety perspective, the FDA would not have a significant number of questions. And that I think really helped uh, repurpose. Now, if it's a first in human, then you have to end up making sure that you uh, work with the FDA to not only to first assess the safety in the phase one and two trials. And I know Chris hates these, especially in lung, in, in rare disorder trials, because there's a merging of all of these numbers. But let's say safety trials versus efficacy trials. So for us, since uh, so we took it took a two pronged approach. One, we excluded those individuals whom we thought would have. Uh, would have characteristics that would interfere with the endpoint assessment. So if they've had very recent bisphosphonate uh, therapy, that could affect the bone mineral density. 
if they have spinal instrumentation that prevents us from measuring their bone density, we excluded those individuals. The second from the safety uh, aspect is again, we went through to make sure that from the FDA prescribing information, you can't use this if people have abnormal alkaline phosphatase because that could be a harbinger of Paget's disease. So we made sure that those people were uh, excluded. Those with abnormal liver functions and others that could contribute to the safety, we excluded them. But uh, other than the gen good clinical practice of exclusion of those individuals with characteristics that may put them at increased risk, we didn't have to meet a higher bar for safety here than in a first than what you would encounter in the first human. Trial. Yeah, yeah, and uh, um, before I launch into the results, and I really had to select a few of them, knowing that we won't have a lot of time to go over just a, a lot of uh, a lot of data that's stored in both the paper itself, supplemental materials. But I just wanted to uh, make a brief stop here at the trial endpoints. When I look at the primary endpoint and the secondary endpoint, I'm sensing that FDA would probably want to see self-reported fractures or the number of fractures in a given period of time as their primary endpoint and the change in the, in the bone mineral density as measured by you know, DEXA or QCT um, would be secondary endpoints. Um, what was the ration, What was the rationale for choosing, you know, primary endpoint as they were? So uh, you're exactly right. If the FDA were to review this and say, "Listen, if you're going to need a new indication for this, you should show a fracture efficacy," they would have liked fractures as the primary endpoint. With uh, forty patients in each um, mm -hmm. uh, randomized groups, uh, you will not have enough events uh, in order to pick up uh, an, a, a decrease in fracture risk within a span of one and a half years. So at that time, we didn't have these numbers as to what would be the per person de uh, fracture incidence and stuff like that. Uh, we have some data now uh, from the European cohorts but that's one of the, with the limited sample size, I don't think we would have been able to detect a meaningful difference in fractures, which we did not in, in the cohort when we looked at the secondary uh, endpoint. So that was the rationale to use a surrogate endpoint that could show a change uh, for this approach. Oh, like I think you're oh, muted. They're, they're still yeah. muted. I, yeah. Desh, I, I think that's, you know, a, a very important thing that you, you just mentioned there. And I, also want to make sure that the trainees understand too that when you run a clinical trial it's not always with the goal of changing the practice of medicine but it may be to figure out where to put further investment to that ultimate um, what the fda may refer to as a pivotal trial or one that holds its own to say this drug should be used for this agent and you know also ultimately allows a pharmaceutical company to market the drug for that indication or in that group of people. And so Sandesh, on, on the spectrum of, you know, completely exploratory to ready to present to the FDA for marketing approval, where would you say that the goals of this trial were? I think they were somewhere in between of uh, saying that uh, because this approach was not tried. And the reason from a genetic standpoint, right, is that, uh, those with more severe OI uh, tend to have sort of uh, a dominant negative effect. So if you make more abnormal type 1 collagen within the bone matrix, would, would that actually translate to a better bone density versus not, right? So the idea was to look at what anabolic therapy does. From a safety perspective, we were not worried. From an efficacy perspective, we needed to know this approach would work. And uh, if it did work quite well, the question was whether this could have gone in for an, for a, for an approval pivotal trial, as you put it. The problem, the issue then would be that we would have had to discuss with the FDA what an acceptable endpoint is. And to this day, in the rare bone disorders field, we're frustrated by the lack of uh, 
a surrogate endpoint that the FDA would accept for drug approval. They mm -hmm. still want fractures, which would mean a lot, of, lot more number of patients. So I would say they're somewhere in between exploratory and, and uh, approval was where this was. And uh, maybe just to make a, one quick comment about the surrogate endpoints is the, uh, the discussion uh, involving FDA about surrogate endpoints uh, shouldn't wait until you get to phase three. Surrogate endpoints, especially for rare diseases, the discussion should probably happen at the preclinical stage before you get to IND. Because there's just so many things, as you can see in this study, uh, primary and secondary endpoints and the ability to advance to the NDA stage. You know, depends so much on what FD FDA uh, considers the big three outcomes, which is better feeling, better function, improved survival. But if you if you can't demonstrate those uh, three things, which in this case would have been probably uh, a decrease in the frequency of fractures, um, uh, FDA uh, probably would, would have uh, would have to agree uh, to use uh, a change or improvement in the bone marrow density as an acceptable surrogate endpoint. But that's not something that needs to be saved until phase three or just about you submit uh, an NDA. Um, I, I think the, so as we, I'm looking at these results, um, I really feel like it's almost uh, the fulfillment of the, uh, of the power calculations. Uh, uh, you know, you predicted you would be able to detect 5% difference, uh, you know, with the cohort that you had. Um, and uh, to, uh, to demonstrate statistical significance that, uh, as, uh, as expected by you. But I, I, maybe I wanted to highlight a slightly different, so and it looks like you're meeting uh, your, uh, the, um, your primary outcome for this uh, clinical trial. But I have a slightly different question. Um, you calculated that you needed 90 individuals. Uh, you enrolled in 78 individuals. And I think there was an interim uh, assessment. Um, can you tell us a little more about the circumstances under which you would say that you know an interim assessment uh, in a control study would be uh, would be necessary? So um, I, I think now for most of these larger studies, interim analyses are being uh, implemented either for uh, to understand whether it's going in the right direction to understand whether there are a group of uh, individuals who respond much better so that then they can be put into an adaptive design. And so it's, it's become a part, of, uh, a part of bettering our clinical trial sort of design. But what I would uh, stress to the trainees is that if you do an interim analysis, you have to account for the fact that you've already done that and you have to uh, adjust that with an adjusted significance ratio. And is, that, so and is, that, is it because you unblind yourself? No, no, you, uh, no. we do not unblind ourselves. So the uh, analysis is done by someone who is- An independent not, group. It is an independent group. Okay. And what they will uh, suggest is uh, whether there is a reasonable degree of, uh, whether you, you are more likely to achieve it with a smaller number more likely to achieve it with a bigger number, or you've already achieved it. So uh, we, we, we can, but, but again, as uh, uh, Oleg did say, that we have to have this for planned interim analysis at specific enrollment points. We can't end up putting this after the trial design. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you have any questions about the slide before I advance to the next one? Yeah, no, I, I think the, the only thing I wanted to add to the, um, question about the interim analyses is I, I think sometimes the way I think about it that may be familiar to geneticists is GWAS. You're doing lots of different tests at different genetic loci, and that's why your p-value has to shift. And 0.05 isn't acceptable in some of those analyses. Similarly, if you're looking at a primary endpoint multiple times, your you know type 1 error rates can change, and, and this is part of the statistical, you know, underpinning that, uh, you know, hopefully you have a bright, aware statistician that's helping with, with these aspects of the trial and analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the next one, uh, the next slide um, really reminds me of a very simple fact is that it, and something we just discussed uh, maybe 15 minutes ago is that a change in the bone mineral density doesn't necessarily uh, translate an increased bone strength. 
And I think, you know, Sandesh, uh, you and I uh, and Chris, we, we talked a little bit about this, uh, you know, uh, during preview of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, lecture, uh, is that it's actually not easy to uh, measure in uh, bone strength non-invasively. How did you, how did you achieve that? And do you think it, this uh, method has the potential to be accepted by FDA in the future as surrogate endpoint? So you're right. There's no, um, th there's no way you can do this in humans. In the mice, in the preclinical studies, once you give the treatment, what you do is you basically do what is called a three-point bend. So you look at the bone here, and you fix it in two points, and then you pressure, and then you see at what load it gives way. So in humans, what you end up doing is you uh, do, do a, uh, a, a quantitative computed tomogram and you sort of, uh, you break down that 3D figure into, uh, into uh, rigid cubes or small cubes and look at, from a computational standpoint, given that this is what the structure is, including the trabecular uh, bone inside, at what load, of uh, pressure is it going to give way or deform? And so it's an estimated sort of uh, bone, uh, it's, a, it's a calculated number using finite element analyses. And what has been shown in the adult population is when you do these FEA in a cadaveric model and you actually then uh, do the three point bending sort of pressure, mm -hmm. there's a very good correlation between those. And that's why you do this. Now, the second question Oleg asked is, is it possible to do it? Is the FDA accepting it? Now, there's a trial with another anabolic plus anti-resorptive uh, anti agent put together. It's called uh, Citrusumab in OI, where they have looked at this uh, uh, at the estimated vertebral strength as, much, as well as volumetric bone density at the radial um, uh, peripheral bones. It's either at the radius or the tibia. And so those sort of uh, discussions are now being had with the, uh, with the FDA. The problem is that you don't have these analyses that are available everywhere. In the United States, there are only five high-resolution QCTs that can measure at the level they want, which would mean that most patients would be excluded unless they travel to the sites. Mm -hmm. So I, I, uh, right now, I don't think the FDA has accepted that as a surrogate one, but the uh, trial with Citrusumab has used one of these estimated vertebral strengths as uh, uh, as one of their primary endpoints. Uh, we got a question from the audience from on uh, why do the total hip bone mineral density decrease in the placebo group after 18 months? Um, as opposed so, to actually, and I'm looking at the lumbar spine uh, bone mineral density, which tends to, uh, appears to go up. So uh, the, the change, so lumbar spine is a lot more responsive because it has a lot more of the cancellous or lamellar bone, while the hip uh, has uh, both uh, cancellous as well as cortical sort of bone. Now, uh, in the, for, I do think that there is always an element of variability that comes in with the assessment. And you would assume that that sort of should normalize over both the control and the population sort of groups. And, or there is actually a decrease without any therapy because we all lose bone density after we hit 30 years of age because we, the formation is not the same as resorption. So the way to look at it is two things. One, that it could be a technical issue itself where there, where there is a drop. But we're hoping that if it's a technical issue, then all of them, including the uh, in the treatment arm, should have been the same. The second, it could have just been a drop because of um, uh, normal wear and tear of the bone. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you, Sandesh, for that. And then this is a very interesting slide that uh, sort of really I, I had to pull some of these data from the supplemental materials. Uh, but really uh, highlights if you subtract uh, uh, OI pay, uh, sub data obtained from, uh, in, from subjects with type OI type three and four, and you only keep um, OI type one, um, you get even higher percent change from baseline. So what's, what's going on here biologically? Oh, um, so th there are some unpublished data that I think uh, 
that we'll be able to share sometime soon. This may have to do with how the uh, PTH signaling is interlinked with another dysregulated pathway within the OI field. But also, I do think that uh, one is type, type one OI, the individuals tend to have haploinsufficiency or null mutations, right? Mm -hmm. So here they have half normal amount of uh, collagen, which is not dominant negative, as opposed to the matrix which is completely different in type three and four. So it may be completely a biological response in what the teriparatide does. I see. I see. Well, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, you know, just to, to be able to learn some of uh, some of that biology um, through a clinical trial, that's fascinating. And uh, I have to say that uh, uh, after this uh, trial, we've, uh, meaning our group, Dr. Lee has led all of those uh, studies here uh, to look mechanistically as to why there may be a differential response in the, in the uh, severe OIs with the minor OIs using, you know, um, mouse models that recapitulate these forms of OI. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm getting to my last uh, uh, slide, but I think it's a loaded one. Um, you know, it appears that uh, there were no difference in the observed uh, uh, frequency of adverse events or serious, serious ad adverse events uh, between the intervention and placebo groups. Uh, there were no uh, serious event, adverse events, but there was one death in the placebo group. And I realized that uh, the vast majority of rare diseases are, you know, carry significant morbidity and mortality uh, with them. Um, you know, I understand that it happened in the placebo group. What if it were to happen in the intervention group? Can you tell us a little more about the implications of, you know, this type of um, serious uh, adverse events? That happened during clinical trial, and sometimes you and I will live through, <laughs> you know, through some of those, right? Uh, I know. Um, I, know. Can you, I, I, you I even know which one you're even talking about, but uh, yeah, but but can you unpack, you know, the implications of those things, um, you know, in the clinical, in the context of a clinical trial? Uh, I think you know it depends as to what specialty you're in. So in Chris's specialty, if you're a, a hemonc sort of uh, uh, where you actually do see SAEs all the time, this would not be unheard of. But death in any clinical trial uh, raises red flags. So what we uh, have to do as investigators would be to uh, see if there is a reasonable possibility that was related to the study intervention. So the relatedness of an SAE, be it a lab abnormality, a clinical abnormality, how was there a temporal relationship with the drug? And uh, do we think it's from a potentially know what we know from the preclinical studies and the temporal association, is it reasonable? If it is, then we have to report it to the not only the uh, local IRBs within uh, in a, an expedited manner, but also uh, a data safety monitoring board that has to review uh, the data. Now, for this trial, uh, the IRB at that time did not require a data safety monitoring board, given mm -hmm. that we were using an intervention that was FDA approved for similar bone-related disorders, and we were using the same um, um, dosage. But if it were to be a first-in-human drug trial, the DMC would have uh, at least um, made sure to review this and give us guidance and what we need to do uh, on progression of the trial. Mm -hmm. I see a question from the audience uh, from Teo. Do you expect the use of uh, peritide uh, for two years or longer in patients with OI? Any concerns regarding osteosarcoma after prolonged use? Okay, so uh, uh, there are. So would you expect the use of teriparatide for two years or longer? And the short answer to that is no. And the reason is uh, the bone formation and resorption are always coupled. Uh, they go sort of hand in hand. So you, typically most agents that increase the bone formation also increase the bone resorption. With use of teriparatide, there's a gap or an anabolic window wherein the re, uh, formation goes much higher 
than the resorption and you can build zone. But if you keep on giving teriparatide for more than two years, that gap closes out and you're not going to get any additional gains. So that is why even in the osteoporosis world or here, therapy is not uh, for more than two years. Now, that's not unique to, um, uh, to teriparatide. Another uh, uh, anabolic agent called uh, romosuzumab, uh, uh, an anti-sclerostin antibody has been approved for adults with osteoporosis. And even there, the therapy is limited to a uh, one-year duration because the gap in which you can build bone would, uh, would close after that. Now, uh, regarding concerns uh, for osteosarcoma, uh, again, this was in the uh, preclinical models in humans this has not uh, panned out, and uh, recent publications uh, have shown that there is no more than a background uh, sort of uh, uh, incidence of osteosarcoma in those who have used teriparatide versus the general population. But uh, again, as I said, I, if I do think that some, so for example, in individuals who've had bone irradiation or uh, a whole uh, beam X-ray irradiation, you can't use this medication. In those who had bone cancer, uh, cancers and who, which have metastasized to bone, I'm very hesitant to use an osteoblastic agent just because even if there are 90 of cancer cells somewhere and you don't know it, I, I, I don't do that. So for those who have cancer, who had uh, a risk of osteosarcoma, Paget's disease, I make sure not to use them in the practice. And I think we have just a, a very small amount of time left. Um, so I was wondering, Sandesh, if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, the overall results of this study and what, how do they inform current or future investigations in OI and clinical trials? So the overall results actually does show that uh, anabolic therapy would be um, something you can try in OI and it is more likely to affect the mild, mild uh, OI than in the more uh, severe forms. Uh, while I don't think we can claim credit for it, um, there are other antibiotic therapies that have come uh, and have been investigated now. Uh, Francis Glohieu, who um, many of you might know, he has been a pioneer in OI research uh, and who introduced the bisphosphonate therapy, has led to the clinical trials of cetrusumab in OI, and they have uh, finished uh, that. They are now the largest OI trials, anabolic OI trials in adults. And I just saw uh, an abstract from them, which really ended up showing that anabolic therapy has the potential to increase bone mineral density robustly in both the mild and severe OIs with cetrosumab. So I think that was one thing that we learned. The second thing we we learned, and again, this may be important for um, uh, the trainees, is that when I was trained, and Oleg will uh, let you know, we were asked to collect everything and anything possible and bank them after the experiments. And sometimes it is painful because we, we don't use that for most of the time. 80% of the time they remain in the refrigerator, but it takes a lot of time, and that was a source of frustration. But for this trial, we had banked plasma uh, from the trial. And what it really, uh, and these are efforts that uh, Lindsay Nickel and, uh, and Eric Orwall have read, led within the Brittle Bone Disorders Consortium, is that they were able to go back and look at some of the biomarkers. We looked at what anabolic therapy does to overall other markers of collagen biomarkers. We were able to look at uh, sclerostin levels and look as to whether this would be uh, this could be used as a biomarker in for the diagnosis or for treatment response with anabolic agents. We were able to develop some from the plasma biomarkers for growth in in OI. So for the trainees, as frustrating as it is to sort of collect more than what you require, it's it's great to have all of these uh, somewhere. And when you get an idea, you always have the samples to go back and do. So that, I think, was a major lesson for, for us. And again, since they're trainees, I have to say, when I did this trial, I didn't have much knowledge about clinical research as well. Uh, I, was a, I, was, I was a trainee in genetics, just becoming a, a junior faculty. 
And what I took out of this is to uh, learning from the senior investigators, Jay Shapiro and Eric Orwell and Brendan Gee, was to how actually to conduct the trial, what it requires, and how I can further my career based not only on the insights I get from this, but to sort of leverage from it. So the, this trial gave me a sort of a platform to say I've done these sort of trials, and when I propose these in my own grant applications, I've not been asked, uh, you, I, we've not seen any, any evidence of you doing it. So when you get opportunities to do things like this, especially at a place like NIH, I would really encourage you to take them with both hands. Okay. Well, uh, Sandesh, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a, a great opportunity for us to learn from your experience. Thank you for uh, sharing your uh, experience. Uh, thank you for taking us behind the scenes. I know that your paper really summarizes a lot of your experience, but there's a whole lot more that uh, goes into clinical trials to make them successful. And we really appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, take a deep dive into uh, sort of that supplemental uh, materials. Uh, thank you so much. Chris, did you want to offer any concluding remarks? Uh, no, I can't add anything else other than more gratitude for joining us and, and sharing the, your experiences. It's a pleasure, and if I may, well, want to put a plug in. So, many, so uh, since we're not within the NIH, we're uh, in the extramural world. Uh, so there are some of the trainee uh, uh, resources that we have developed with the uh, with the generous support of the NIH, and one of them is called the. OI Teleecho series. So if you were to Google osteogenesis imperfecta teleecho, and uh, let me uh, try to uh, get, the, uh, um, uh, get the URL for you. So there is an OI Teleecho series that basically has a lot of nice lectures and clinical management uh, for uh, rare bone disorders. So please make sure that, uh, you know, if you want to look into that, there's also a rare bone uh, uh, Echo, which uh, which talks about a lot of uh, rare bone disorders. Many of the speakers are from the uh, NIH, so you will uh, it'll be instructional for you. So thank thank you very much for uh, allowing me to uh, spend some time with you. And just to follow up, uh, Sandesh on uh, te uh, on Teleecho, I just uh, posted a link uh, to our uh, uh, Twitter. Um, uh, where we featured uh, the upcoming tele uh, echo clinic series and rare bone disease, the dysmorphology exam for skeletal dysplasias by Dr. Danita Velasco. So she is at the University of Nebraska, and uh, the link will contain a uh, another link uh, to uh, for uh, uh, interested uh, trainees to uh, register for that um, event. Again, Sandesh, th thank you so much for joining us. It was a great, great pleasure. Uh, to learn from an experienced uh, clinical uh, investigator like you. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, hosting uh, you uh, in the future, knowing that you uh, uh, do uh, clinical research, not only in bone diseases, but also metabolic disorders. There you go. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Thank you.